All right, I think we can, yeah, go ahead and close the other one. All right, thanks for uh, coming in at the end of the day, y'all, appreciate that. Um, we'll go ahead and get started um, right now. So uh, my name is Chris Russo. I'm here representing Savas Labs. Um, this is our first time as a company to DrupalCon, so it's pretty exciting for us, my first time speaking. Um, so I'm excited about that too. Um, this session is about the total value of ownership, and I'll do a little prep before I exactly expose you to what I mean by that. Um, but the idea is, to, uh, is a, to look at what value you're getting out of Drupal, especially how it compares to other options in the CMS market space. So who are we? Um, we are a group of eight, uh, half guys, half gals. Uh, we're centered in Durham, North Carolina, which is in the Triangle region of North Carolina. Any of y'all are familiar with that place? It's an exciting and growing place, a lot of technology. Um, that map is sort of representative of roughly what the triangle looks like. Uh, you might associate better with those symbols if you're a sports fan, basketball especially. Um, Duke and UNC and NC State, big basketball schools. Uh, personally, I could not care less about uh, those schools as far as basketball goes, and I think that's actually beneficial to this talk in some way because um, it's not sort of loyalty out of location, and I think that translates to Drupal a little bit too in trying to be impartial about its strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we are also, th that's our headquarters in, is in Durham, North Carolina, but we also have some distributed folks. We don't say remote anymore. Um, Boston, Boston Mass, Portland, Oregon, and Chattanooga, Tennessee are some of those lo locations, so uh, if you're looking to work with us, and you're in those markets, we'd love to meet with you in person when at all possible. Uh, you cannot follow me. You can follow us on social media. Um, I don't have a personal Twitter account, so you, that's the reason you cannot do that. I've created this wonderful graph that goes to explain I'm a bit too far on the laziness end of the spectrum and not quite high enough on the narcissism end of the spectrum, although I'm there. So don't, I mean, it's worth pointing out that I made my head larger than Gandhi's uh, on this slide, for example. And, um, and by the way, if, if you get a chance to, and you haven't yet read Kanye West's Twitter feed, it's, it's totally worth it. I think, you know, sometimes, I think he does, he's, he's working through some stuff, so if anything, it might make you feel a little better about whatever you might be going through. And while we're on the topic of social media, um, I, did, I did fire off a few earlier today to kind of get some, some buzz going. Um, there is actually no truth to Jam from Acquia's association to Jam Room CMS, but that actually is a real thing that I discovered when searching the CMS marketscape. Um, and so there are no rumors to quell, as I suggested that there might be. Uh, but if you are interested in Drupal and fake news, you might want to check out our Twitter feed. Um, don't forget I did, I did score decently high on the narcissism, his narcissism scale, so I will share a little bit about me. Um, this is, that's kind of work me and real me, and if you're too far away to see the real me photo, it's, uh, it's actually a work trip, somewhat ironically, but we're out kayaking along the sunset, so I kind of you know, enjoy being outside. I'm an active person. I biked to the conference only from a few miles away, but you always, almost always see me on a bicycle. Um, so for the next you know, 45 minutes or so, you'll get the work me. Um, and then if you attend the social events after, you can get the real me. Um, I'll keep going about myself. Uh, the other, this is sort of the other half of my life. Uh, I founded this bicycle powered composting company called Tilthy Rich Compost, and this is downtown Durham, NC. And that's not actually me, but uh, uh, one of our riders. Uh, but it's kind of helps explain my balance of really liking cycling and environmental aspects. And, you know, and wouldn't you know it, we built, of course, our website in Drupal. 
So I also want to kind of, now it seems like even a few more folks have trickled in, uh, just get an understand, understanding of who you all are. Um, so how many folks in the room are technologists, developers, working on actual projects? Okay, so that's maybe 75% or so. Um, are the rest, how many folks are business owners or sales or sort of that end? Okay, so maybe there's a fair, that was about 50, so there, those might not be as cleanly separated as I might have thought, but that makes sense too. Um, how about freelancers, individuals working not part of a team for the most part? One, two, saw a small hand back there. Um, so then everyone else part of a team, working with a team, yes? Roughly, head, yes, okay. Um, how about s folks who work exclusively or pretty much exclusively with Drupal as your product or service? Two thirds. Um, how about folks that work with Drupal and a mix of other things? Those could be proprietary, maybe well, about half. How about folks who don't work with Drupal at all and are trying to get to know it a little better? A little better? Okay, a couple, three, four. Um, okay, that's helpful. <clears throat> so um, my roots date back to 2007 with, the, um, with working with Drupal. Uh, I started as a butcher here, and what I mean by that is uh, I was given a job I was totally unqualified for, um, straight out of college with about two weeks of PHP experience. Um, I was essentially handed a book and said, our project's late, you have no support, figure out how to build this. Uh, so naturally I did whatever, was, whatever worked uh, with a pretty limited knowledge of what I shouldn't do and ended up you know, hacking core and doing all sorts of the things that we know, those of us who know Dr Drupal sort of cringe at. Um, but that's, that was my start, so I kind of dived into it pretty deeply, um, learned through mistakes, and now I'm running a Drupal agency. So I don't know if that's a good thing for Drupal or not, but that is the reality. Um, but I do think that's the way a lot of people learn. Um, you know, there isn't maybe as enough training and support as, as we might hope, and a lot of people learn on their own because it's open source and it's available. <clears throat> Okay, so total value of ownership. So I'll get into that a little bit more now. Um, the talk, I'm trying to look again at the CMS landscape at large and you know, understand the value that we're delivering. We're able to deliver with Drupal and other products and how, how that all lays out. Um, the idea of total cost of ownership, which I'll get to in the next slide, is something that is somewhat known and that's just the idea of what, is it co what does it cost me as a client to support this website project that you're working on and building for me. So that usually boils down to custom development time, hosting costs, ongoing support and maintenance, those kind of things. And the idea is you add all that up and you see what it costs. And my argument or what I'm at least trying to explore and talk about is um, that's just one side of the equation. And you know, if you're just comparing how much did it cost me to build and maintain this site and how much did it cost me to build and maintain this other completely different site, you're not getting at what value the organization is getting out of those, which is, in my opinion, the most important thing to look at. So, um, and then I've got a little description here of what total cost of ownership is, so I'll just read it. Uh, the total cost of ownership is a financial estimate intended to help buyers and owners determine and direct the direct and indirect costs of a product or system. Okay, so obviously we need to somewhat define value if we're going to look at value across the CMS landscape. So <clears throat> I, value is um, something that is definitely objectively difficult to measure in a uniform way across all projects. I think for certain um, projects it makes more sense in certain verticals and certain kinds of companies it makes more sense, but it's a, admittedly a difficult thing to say this is value, exactly. And it's definitely defined by each organization. For example, if you're an online re retailer, you're probably looking at total sales. If you're a nonprofit, a mission-based nonprofit, you're probably looking at, you know, reach to your audience and perhaps increase in fundraising. Um, if you're, in a, you know, an editorial and you want to publish a lot, you might see how, you know, 
how well that tool facilitates your ability to publish quickly and more often and reach more subscribers, that sort of thing. Um, and our job as vendors to these clients is, is to ascertain what that value is, and I think that's an important thing to start from and really, you know, even as part of your selection process, say, is what we're intending to build and deliver what is going to give them the most value? And it may be the case that there's another option that is not within your skill set, and oftentimes that's a good time if you're fortunate enough to say this is not a project for us. <clears throat> so I'll start, um, admittedly, as I mentioned, my experience is uh, mostly in Drupal. So I've talked to a lot of people, did a lot of research. I, you know, obviously the proprietary larger CMSs are, uh, when they come by all sorts of different names when you get up at that level of investment. Um, th those are a player in the game as well. Um, it's not something that I have, you know, the projects that we're bidding on and working on are not necessarily competing at that multi-million dollar a year level, which is usually what these guys are, are roughly um, fit for. Um, so anyway, I'll just I'll run through them quickly. I think it's kind of funny that this is Sitecore and Adobe, the top two on the left. Pretty similar looking logos, no? Um, there's got to be a lawsuit pending, if not in action on that at the moment. EpiServer is another uh, a leader in the market, and I'll show you a couple published uh, graphs for, for those who know more about this than I do. But, um, Ektron and EpiServer recently in 2015 merged. Um, SDL, Oracle, HP is that green box. Um, and then there's open text. So I, I would say it's, I mean, doing this research was like a bit intimidating because there are just so many options. There are even more open source options once we get to that point. Um, but you, you know, you've got to whittle it down. We've got a question. HP did? Okay, so we've got an update to these slides. <laughs> HP is sold. We can merge those bottom two into one. I know. It's so s simple. Simple is beautiful. Yeah, and probably a lot of money. Um, I also thought, I think this joke is coming, but I just, open text is a proprietary CMS. That's, that strikes me as hilarious. That's good. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's the rough landscape. We'll look at, you know, I think this is the, there's, I have a forester and a gardener uh, to, you know, research companies that evaluate these, and you probably cannot see it that well from where you are, but this is essentially a graph that t as you get to the top right, it's better and better. They've got these dividers that are called leaders, you know, strong performers and contenders. Um, one thing that's worth pointing out, again, that you cannot see is that Acquia is... is the dot I just pointed to. Um, which is well, well positioned in the strong contenders spot. And um, it's, it's even stronger on strategy than almost everything else except for Adobe, um, but not quite as strong on uh, current offering. And those are a bit vague, but I think that roughly means completeness of vision, which is another a term that these markers t typically use. Um, <clears throat> this is another graph, another breakdown, and again, I don't have a red pointer, but it's the only other thing I wanted to point out here is they actually have Automatic, which is the, Word, the um, WordPress private company that kind of drives WordPress, um, and they are down, they're down in the bottom right quadrant, and Acquia is, is fairly well up in right uh, position comparatively, comparatively to WordPress, and again, all the other ones are proprietary systems, not just private companies that have a solution. Um, so as far as open source leaders, again, this was, an, this was a difficult one to whittle down. I tried to essentially do it by market share with the ones that you're looking at. Um, as we know, that's not the only important metric to look at um, because there is a case to be made about simplicity suggests large market share versus uh, more nuanced and niche um, solutions. So that's WordPress, top left, um, Joomla. Next one in Drupal 8, um, Plone. Out of curiosity, anyone working with, recently worked with Plone in the room? No hands. Um, Blogger, which is this kind of 
blurring the lines of what is a CMS and what is just a blogging platform. But as far as uh, the research shows, and I'm relying on W3 techs and built with uh, to get that research. They both show pretty much the same. Built with is a little bit better at showing trends and uh, where things are going. Um, and the last one is .NET Nuke, .NET Nuke, um, which is a .NET CMS. Um, but one thing I, I think one thing that's, well, it's worth pointing out is the top four are all PHP. Of course, .NET Nuke is .NET, and Blogger is a, a service. Um, sorry, the top three are PHP. Plone is Python. Um, Plone has been stated as a more secure platform than other open source proprietary systems. And the, it's a little def difficult like any stats to kind of justify that. I think there are some, there are some, um, they have fewer of these common vulnerable exposures, CVE, you know, when Drupal le releases a big security risk, um, a security threat that goes in, in this uh, MITRE backed database. Uh, which, you know, anyway, it's hard, to, it's hard to say, is it definitely more secure or not, but it has this perception of being more secure, and I think in that, way is, in that way it can be more easily sold to risk averse institutions, governments, that sort of thing. So it's, um, it's on the way down uh, as far as market share, but I think may still hold on due to that fact. Um, and what we're looking at really is, you know, is all historical data, so I think that's, um, it's helpful to sort of know where you've been, to know where you're going, that sort of idea, but I think it's most interesting to look, look into the future, and that's sort of the idea of what we're doing. Um, I have this, this short list of who to watch, and that those are just, again, focusing on trends. As we know, in technology, things can move really quickly, and something that wasn't very present a year ago can come along and grab up a lot of market share. So uh, Craft CMS is also a PHP CMS. Has anyone in the room worked with that at all? There was something that was pretty new to my radar, but a pretty well-established company around us said they prefer it over WordPress and Drupal, and it does seem to be gaining a little bit of market share. Um, Magento is the one in the middle, which is uh, you know, it's mostly an e-commerce platform, so again, definitely blurring the lines of what is a CMS, but that came up um, and is actually growing uh, year over year for the past few years, so I think that you know the complexity of what e-commerce builds looks like look like sort of seem to be showing that a, a tool specifically fit for that is is often going to be the best choice. Um, Ghost is uh, the one on the bottom left, which is a uh, Node.js CMS, so pretty new. Um, also gaining a little bit of traction. It's got a nice interface. You know, a lot of the advantages that you hear people speaking about WordPress are saying Ghost is the next thing, but definitely comprises less than 0.1% of the market. Um, and then Keystone JS is another node JS. Um, and sorry, the one on the top right is PrestaShop, which is also an open source PHP, like Magento, um, e-commerce platform, which is, is growing as well. So as far as trying to you know, narrow the scope of all of that down to a little bit, something a little bit more refi refined and applicable to the landscape that we're all in as, as uh, developers and business owners, is that most of the um, CMS market is still open source PHP. I looked at, um, you know, Django and Rails, and re there's a CMS called Refinery that's on Rails, um, and these are, you know, usually uh, less than a percent of the market share. So it's really it's, and, and those are some um, platforms that have been around for a while, so it's not, it's unlikely, I suppose, to say that they would just spike up out of nowhere and, and capture a lot of share. So, you know, it's helpful to see where Drupal fits in. Um, and in this graph, if the, the, the red dot on the top left uh, is Drupal, and so the x-axis is how many sites and um, the y-axis is traffic of those sites. So I was actually pretty resistant to this finding. Uh, I was, you know, I have sort of someone who's tired of the WordPress versus Drupal um, battle and, you know, justification for one over the other. But it does, 
what we're looking at and the research I've done and, and just my experience does seem to suggest that it's sort of what maybe some of us already feel or know and that Drupal is a more complicated, steeper learning curve, but more potentially powerful tool to harness and therefore is more fit for more complicated sites. Whereas, um, you know, in the WordPress comparison, it often has an easier use case for, for folks and they can spin a lot of them up uh, more quickly. And that's, that's what this graph is, is seeming to state quite clearly. And the others on there are Magento, Blogger, and Joomla. Joomla is the farthest down on the um, traffic side and uh, second most in, in, in site installation. So, again, whittling that down, I'm, I'm primarily trying to compare at the moment Drupal, Joomla, and WordPress. So this, this graph is a Google Trends graph on search terms, and yet another way to try to look at this, not a perfectly accurate uh, statement of market share, because what if you're all really searching, why isn't Drupal working, and I love WordPress. Um, but the blue is WordPress, so you know, at some point around 2011, it kind of went up ahead of everyone and has remained there for a while. Um, yellow, which is sloping downward, is Joomla. And Drupal has sort of been somewhat static and lower compared to the other two, but I think one thing important to point out is it seems like Joomla has dipped, and there's reason to believe that it will continue to in comparison um, with Drupal. Um, it's also another trend to point out is that um, according to markets and markets from 2015, which of course has already come and gone, to 2020, they're expecting a, basically a two-fold increase in CMS industry investment from roughly three and a half billion to almost $7 billion. So it's good news um, for those of us in the industry, but also interesting to look forward on, and to what's coming. So how is Drupal 8 doing? is um, something worth looking at. Uh, this is, what we're looking at here is the adoption of Drupal 8 with you know, the project usage statistics on drupal.org. Um, if you look, at the top number is essentially, or the top row is essentially present day or a week ago, and there are 100,000 Drupal 6 sites versus 70,000 Drupal 8 sites. Um, so we're, we're, ta we're almost six months into Drupal 8 having been launched, and we're still at a point where Drupal 8 lags behind Drupal 6. So that, that does mean something, um, and Dries has written about this per quite recently, uh, last week. I think I was the last person to comment on this blog post, um, trying to justify and saying that Drupal 8 is catching on and we're doing great, and I think there was good and healthy feedback from the community saying, well, maybe, um, I'll, and I'll go to the Drupal 7 statistics, maybe we're not quite as doing as well as Drupal 7 w did. Um, and if you look at these statistics, Drupal 7's launch, I believe was January 5th, 2011, so these usage statistics, the top two, are kind of in between that date. But it, the second row shows that Drupal 7, um, there were more Drupal 7 installations than Drupal 5 the week it was launched. So folks are already on 7, and it was already better than two, two versions prior to it as far as adoption. So that's um, you know, something worth looking closely at, and, I, and like I was saying, I think there was a healthy debate about that, and uh, there are lots of complicated reasons as to why that is. I have a few uh, suggestions. Um, migration in general is something that's been a little bit difficult. Um, and, and continues to be improved, so it's something that I, I believe a lot of folks were waiting for that process to become more mature before they felt comfortable, comfortable going from six or seven to eight. Um, there, there were some key contributed modules um, that you know, lagged for a little bit of, a little bit of time, like Path Auto and, and even some of the e-commerce contributed modules that would, you know, a lot of these bigger sites are relying on. And obviously, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that there are significant architectural changes in the code base um, make it difficult to, you know, make it, makes it difficult on your development team who is used to six and seven, even five, and those of us fortunate enough to be involved with four, which does not include me, 
um, need to you know shift into a totally different realm. I think, and strategically, how does that, you know, how's that position, how does that help, what does that look like for us now as we're, where we're standing? And my personal, my personal feeling is that the Drupal 8 platform now is, does a good job of playing two roles. And one is that it, out of the box, is something that has got a nicer UI, you can do more, uh, you know, some like views and things like that are baked into core. Um, so it provides that sort of site builder experience and the ease of transition from folks who were primarily, prim primarily site builders before. It's not that different of a tool, it just works better in a lot of ways and is nicer and is mobile responsive and all that. At the same time, it's opened up to a wider yet more sophisticated PHP developer community, so folks that are used to object-oriented program and Symfony and all that. Uh, so I, I, my take is that it's in the long run going to work out well and that it can kind of fit both of those use cases, the more simple site builder implementer use case and the more complicated build use case. Um, but of course that's, you know, that's a heated, somewhat heated debate in the community and that it doesn't go without its challenges. I think backdrop CMS and that sort of thing is, has been spun up um, due to some of these complexities and the fear that that would be a difficult system to adopt. So it'll be something interesting to watch and, and see how that progresses. So I'm going to try to define value in this pretty specific way and look at Drupal in this light throughout the rest of the talk. And it's basically just smart people working real time on solving problems and creating new value. So what do I mean by that? Essentially, there's a lot that we don't know that will happen on the web that we will not be driving force of and the only way to adapt and move quickly is to have a well-built-out community and contributors who are continuing to build for that community. So what we're going to have in Drupal 8.3 or 4 or 5, we don't yet completely know in Drupal 9. And the most valuable thing we can do is retain and reward that community and, and keep them thriving. Um, so there, there's this, trying to put some metrics and numbers to it, there's this um, openhub.net. Um, site where you can they use uh, <coughs> these metrics to sort of quantify the amount of time spent on particularly open source projects where there's access to the code base. It used to be called Olo. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. I prefer the old name because it's closer to YOLO, but it's Open Hub now. So if you go to that site, you'll essentially see uh, a tool called Kokomo. Let's take it. Let's take it. Oh. I'll just turn my speakers up as loudly as I can. Look at Tom Cruise cocktail. Where? Oh, where is he going? We don't know where he's going. You're not going to find out. You have to watch cocktail. Cruise in the 80s in his heyday. Woo. But anyway, Kokomo is this tool that, um, as I described, is, you know, uh, surveys an open source project, tries to understand and analyze time spent. And the Drupal, Drupal 8 has roughly 1.2 million lines of code. Now, of course, this includes Symfony and other, you know, built or getting off the island things built elsewhere. Um, but that roughly translates to 194 person years of work. So, you know, that's just an incredible investment, in my opinion. And I think there's reason for this to be a actually somewhat drastically conservative estimate. Um, this Kokomo tool is was developed in the early 80s, and it was made for projects of, or it was used, some a study of some 60 projects that were 2,000 lines of code up to 100,000 lines of code. And of course, those were projects that were primarily built under one roof, so to speak. Not at all a distributed community all over the world, people speaking different languages. Um, and again, just as we know, as, as projects grow and grow, they get riskier and they take more time at that larger level and that technical debt is something to get over. So I would say, I'm not, I, I think it's, it's possible that it's conservative by an, an order of magnitude and it's more like, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 people years of development time. So it's just an incredible investment and it's one of the largest open source projects out there. Uh, by comparison, Joomla, <clears throat> is 88, roughly 88 years, or sorry, 86 years 
of investment, and WordPress is 108 years. So still both with a lot of time, blood, sweat, and tears poured into the project, um, but clearly Drupal stands out. Um, and also as far as the contributor community goes, um, if you look at DrupalCores.com, where if you're familiar, it's a list of all the people that contributed to Drupal 8, <laughs> they attribute uh, 3,538 de uh, developers or folks who, com who contributed to Drupal 8. <clears throat> and the, I think I have these numbers right, but the WordPress core committer community is roughly 55. Um, and Joomla is, is somewhere in the uh, low 300s. So it's just access to a much more present and larger audience. And that comes with you know, uh, positives and negatives, but I think it is a more accessible and more involved framework from that standpoint. Uh, again, speaking to the community, we've, you know, the, if you go to get involved, drupal.org slash get involved, you'll see 100,000, you know, over 100,000 users. Um, and just last week, there were, you know, 2,500 commits and 4,800 comments. So, you know, obviously, we're, I don't know if everyone shares this feeling, but I sort of have this uh, impression that Drupal used to be a very, very developer oriented community. And now we're doing a better job at thinking more about user experience and opening that up to other stakeholders in the project that ultimately make it a more mature project product. And you know, all those comments, those aren't just developers going back and forth. Those are, you know, project managers co commenting on an issue queue or and folks contributing to documentation and that sort of thing. So um, I think you know the community is an essential asset to really um, to really speak about to your prospective clients and in, the, in that vein of the future is we don't know and an active community is what you need. Uh, so I'm not the first person to have said this or thought this, but I think it's worth revisiting from time to time. Uh, the quote on the slide is from Dries and he says, it's really the Drupal community and not so much the software that makes the Drupal project what it is. So fostering the Drupal community is actually more important than just managing the code base. So I think that, that captures that really well, and it's also a nice, uh, it's a nice thing to hear from the, the Drupal leader, as it were, and I think it rings very true. And actually, uh, if you all were at the Dries note this morning, he kind of reinforced this in a different way, um, but said, quoting, we still exist because we keep reinventing ourselves. So he said that just this morning at DrupalCon, and I think, again, that, that perfectly captures the idea. So <clears throat> we understand that Drupal is valuable, and especially those who know it well and have been using it for a while. I think it's, it's helpful to think about when Drupal does not make sense. Um, I think one of the key areas where Drupal doesn't make sense is if you're doing sort of a one-off involvement. In other words, your client isn't necessarily interested in any sort of ongoing improvements or, or the access to new features in the future that might be nice or doesn't take you know, security seriously, that sort of thing. Um, and that, you know, that can be something a bit difficult to figure out, but ultimately what you're, what you're getting with Drupal is the access to those things and the fact that you'll need to maintain uh, you know, doing security updates and paying attention to the site means you're staying involved for a longer time. So it's not, it's not as well fit as, for example, a WordPress where maintenance is a little bit easier and security updates are a little bit easier and more managed by admins than developers. Um, I write battling inertia. So that, that can take a lot of different uh, meanings. Ultimately, um, one, one way of thinking about that is a client that's used to and loves WordPress, for example, or Joomla, or whatever else, whatever it may be. Um, just because, you know, there's a lot invested in folks' comfort and familiarity with a certain product and a certain software, and you don't want to battle that too much, in my experience. It doesn't mean that you can never take over a WordPress or a Joomla or a Plone or whatever other installation. It just means to be mindful of that. Uh, you know, it also can be in the, you can also think of inertia as if you're collaborating with someone and they already have a development team, are they, and they're expected to be involved in the project, are they gonna be able to make that shift to Drupal if it is from something else? Um, and you know, I think ultimately, ultimately when folks have a bad experience with Drupal that, in, you know, in a somewhat indirect but real way, 
um, affects the, the breadth of the community. So if, if you are trying to shoehorn a project in that doesn't really make sense, um, that's, those are kind of the opportunities where you're, you're better off saying no, maybe somebody else can help you better. And especially it's, it's useful to you know, establish relationships with others that you do know do those other things better so that you're still in some way consulting and being a friendly face and being a, a helpful advisor and saying, you know, we, we don't do that great. We're going to be honest with you. Go with them. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so I th what I think um, results from, you know, this whole looking at value in this way is it's a few, it's a call to action to a lot of stakeholders in Drupal. Um, I was at an open, uh, what's it called? I'm forgetting the name of the conference right now. All Things Open last year, and Mark Laven had this quote who, um, who's a hiring manager for, they're actually a Django shop, and they are about 20 feet away from us in downtown Durham. Um, and he's, he had this quote that it takes time and mentorship to contribute to open source, and not everyone has those two things. So I think it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very difficult thing to contribute in a really meaningful way. Those of us who are in businesses who at least are, allow, you know, are paid to do some of this work, it's a little bit easier because you, in some regards, have that privilege to do that. Um, but it's a hard thing, and it's especially a hard thing on your free time. And you know, that's a big part about fostering the community and making those um, opportunities more accessible to the rest of the community that uh, take, will take Triple a long way. And um, I've got a video here of Wim, Wim Lears, who's an Acquia, a Drupal 8 um, core developer, and is responsible for Big Pipe and some of the other caching, uh, and so other you know, larger improvements in Drupal 8. I think he kind of captures that. I call it privilege and obligation. He doesn't necessarily use the word privilege, but we'll see what he has to say. Precisely because you have to be able to work on that particular area for a long stretch of time in order to get it to completion and otherwise you're you're going to leave it in a partially finished state which would be far less than ideal and so yeah i i, I think most of us who have uh, the ability to contribute full-time actually try to make sure that um, they help people who are doing it in their spare time help those people push forward those more tricky problems um, uh, and try to support them along the way to help them get it to the finish line I think because many of us feel that obligation. So I think that's a pretty, you know, it captures that well, and he's got a good perspective in, in my view of an obligation at the business level. Um, so that kind of naturally leads to call to action for businesses. Um, you know, support Drupal, right? Um, it's, it's sort of this idea of you get what you get and don't get upset, right? So. You know, I think there are very real selfish reasons for businesses, especially at a certain scale, to support Drupal. You know, it can definitely be helpful to your image. If you've got contribution in the code base, it looks like you're an expert, because you are an expert. Um, so you do, doing things like hosting uh, code sprints and hosting meetups and um, contributing code and, and having paid set aside time to contribute code, I think are essential things uh, for the survival and the thriving of Drupal. And I think the more that the business community embraces that, um, the more likely we are to continue to, to thrive. Um, the, it's, I sort of think about it in the way of, uh, I think Mark Zuckerberg and you know some of those other extraordinarily wealthy folks have this idea of this giving pledge. I think it's givingpledge.org. It's somewhat similar in that they're, oh, we have all this money. Um, we pledge to do good with this money by the time we kick the bucket, as it were. So I think in that same regard, those who are benefiting a lot from Drupal uh, do have a bit of an obligation to give back. And I, I definitely appreciate it can be a difficult thing to juggle as a smaller and growing company because you know there aren't infinite margins for us to do that. But it's something that if you see more of in the community, it's going to be a better product. Um, and if, for example, this is... Uh, this is a Drupal, a, a Drupal agency. I won't be specific who they are, but I've subscribed to their newsletter. Um, it's the, and they say, our investment in Drupal 8 has given us unprecedented access to the latest Drupal 8 techniques and put us light years ahead of other agencies. They actually wrote of others agencies. That's not my mistyping. 
Um, but you know, clearly, whether or not that's a strong marketing, um, light years ahead, maybe not, but regardless, they're clearly saying, we've been building Drupal, we're experts, Drupal 8, we're experts, work with us, we're the best. And so there are very real benefits to that. Um, and I think I'm loosely using this term Drupal leadership. This is a call to action, in my opinion, for Drupal leadership broadly. And that means, uh, you know, the governance of Drupal, how, you know, again, business community, leaders all over Drupal, and just providing, uh, you know, resources to do, to do these Drupal 6 to 7 to 8 migrations, right? There's, you know, I, I speak to my development team and certain folks who've had a, a foundation in just starting with Drupal 7, it's a, it is a big curve to get to Drupal 8 and uh, work with object-oriented programming and different, you know, different, it's a whole different model. So there's the more the, the leadership community can kind of get these resources out there, the better. Um, I think this is something that's also been talked a lot about, and I think in general Drupal, Drupal does a very good job, but, you know, facilitating contribution and making that easier. Um, you know, you can spin around in an issue queue for a long time sometimes, or uh, it, there, there are certain barriers that make it difficult to contribute. And I think those are things we'll just have to keep working on and pay close attention to over time. Um, yeah. So what is beyond? Um, I definitely don't know that, and I don't think anyone else um, can speak, you know, super honestly and say they know exactly where the web is going. So, uh, since that is the case, uh, I think we should do all that is in our power, uh, reasonably within our power, to foster an active and healthy Drupal community. And ultimately, that is what I think the value of the future of Drupal will be. And I, last slide, I just wanted to thank um, some contributors to my talk. I spoke with. Um, CEO of Sandstorm Design, Sandy Marsico. My team was helpful in giving feedback, uh, very helpful. We do host a local meetup, um, the Tri Doug Meetup, Triangle Drupal Users Group, uh, who was also helpful in brainstorming about how to approach it. And I did speak with a Built With founder who um, you know, walked me through some of their statistics and how to analyze some of that. Um, and that is time for Q&A. <laughs> Okay, so I will ignore Doug in the front. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. Oh. Wow. That's a perk. Perk of speaking, y'all. Free watches. Um, go ahead. Doug Cisco from Isovera, Waltham, Massachusetts. Go ahead. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Sure. Sure. So the question is roughly with those those new entrants, the the ones I said what to watch for. What, what are the threats to Drupal in that marketplace? And I, you know, all of those, if I recall correctly from the stats, all of them were like 0.1% of market share or lower. And Drupal, you're looking at depending on the study, um, you know, 7% to 15%, somewhere in that realm. And Joomla also in that realm, roughly the same. Um, I, I, I can't identify anything that's a clear like, oh, they look like they're going to do this better. It's just sort of something looking at the trends. For example, uh, Ghost, which is um, Node.js, CMS. It, in this built, if you look at the built with tool, it shows you, tra you know, changes over a week. What, like, they break things down by top, you know, top sites with 100,000 top sites traffic wise down to 10,000. And Ghost recently, just last week, went from zero to eight of the top 10,000. So it's, that's a significant thing. Of course, they're not likely to sustain that level of growth all the time, but that's something to look for. Is that helpful? Yes, in the back.
So the question roughly was, do we have stats or even anecdotal uh, story or two about, is it easier to migrate from five to eight or six to eight or seven to eight versus, or is that, more, is that migration process more difficult than migration processes in the past? Um, a year and a half ago when I started the company, I sort of stepped out of the actual development role, but our CTO is in the room, and if anyone else has any specific insight into that, um, into whether Drupal 8 migration is actually more difficult, uh, I would love to hear. <laughs> Go ahead, Costa. <laughs> And, and just so I can get it into the mic, I guess my anecdotal, you know, the, the typical Drupal stance is that you'll have an easy, I'm air quoting, way to migrate your data, but of course functionality, the sacrifice of Drupal moving so quickly and developing on top of itself and changing APIs and all that gets you the latest and greatest, but it means that your backwards compatibility of code is uh, ne never guaranteed. But I did, I did a point and click seven to eight upgrade at least that the data worked. That's my anecdote, and there, <laughs> and there is a, if there is a mic there, I'm happy to repeat the question. So if y'all want to stay, but yeah, go ahead in the back. Yeah. So the question is, um, would you recommend a Fortune 1000 company who's not on Drupal to build on Drupal 8 or stick with Drupal 7? Um, the more, I don't think it really makes too much of a difference from a functionality st standpoint as whether you're a Fortune 1000, 5000, 10,000, or you're not publicly traded. But it's, it's always, it's this answer that we as, uh, you know, we always say is that it depends. So I think, I think an honest, um, an honest vendor will try to walk you through that process. If you're a Fortune 1000 company, you've got the resources to mitigate your risks and to do a full-on discovery and say, here are all the things we exactly want and need out of this site build. And then, then the, you know, your prospective vendor should have the ability to say, yes, I can definitely do this with Drupal 8. In most circumstances, we're saying yes, and again, as time goes, especially after this week when a lot more improvements will be made with folks on site, that, that sacrifice or that lesser functionality that you are getting with Drupal 8 uh, as it stands is kind of going away. So the more time goes on, the better Drupal 8 looks for you. Hopefully that was helpful rambling. Yeah.
Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Yeah, I agree. It, it wasn't necessarily a question, but it's a, definitely a valid thing to re or to affirm that if you're talking about building on Drupal seven now and thinking about that, you're also shortening the lifespan of of the you know the clients um, of that website. It's I don't know that there there are a lot of folks on the on our team that seem to think the way that you know the Drupal eight rollout is going that Drupal nine will come sooner. Than Drupal 8 did compared to 7. I don't. I can't substantiate that with any real data, but it's feasible to think that that's the case, and it won't be a five-year window. It'll be closer to three three-year window. So then, if you're on Drupal 7 and 9 comes out in three years, you're three years and three months or six months. You're you're exposed to security threats that you um, aren't with. Wouldn't be with 8 or 9. Any other questions? It's got to be one or two. Costa. Go ahead. Um, so, you know, going back to like the community being the strength of Drupal, um, one thing is I'm wondering about if you come across this in your research was um, like what's the rate of adoption of different technologies for developers? Like what are young developers learning today? Um, my, uh, my cursory investigation on Reddit shows that. <laughs> Yeah, that's so. Uh, let me try to distill that down into uh, something a little shorter. And so, what's my sense in the research that I've done of other technologies and their level of adoption versus Drupal or PHP, for example? And I think th that you know, I kept finding myself ha having to narrow the research to be able to speak in some sort of um, coherent way about something small enough that it made sense. Uh, I do. I did look at things like stars on GitHub and different projects, and that is where you see Node, various Node.js projects and different, you know, JavaScript frameworks exceeding. But I, I think in a in a somewhat unsophisticated way, those are there are tools in unsophisticated way, meaning my analysis of it. There are those are tools that are easy to spin things up more quickly, but maybe don't have as advanced of a feature set as a more well-established product. So. In that regard, they're not currently competing in the same level. And even when I was referencing those Keystone JS, which I, I think it had roughly amount, the same amount of stars on GitHub as does Drupal, but the Drupal community is not really, you know, it's focused a little bit away from GitHub. So it's not, I don't know if that's a fair comparison. Um, so all, all that to say, <coughs> there, it's stuff to keep an eye on. And it's just like, you know, we have to change quickly with whatever else is out there and we can leverage those things if they're open source to improve the whole you know what is it rising tides lift all boats uh, that sort of that sort of mentality I think stands true Doug actually our Doug already asked a question does anyone else anyone else have a question before Doug's comment go ahead Doug oh Definitely. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll restate that into the mic. So Doug is saying that, <clears throat> you know, more native apps, clients are certainly requesting those. There's this idea of decoupled front end that Drupal 8 has pushed a lot. And I know there's been a lot of folks have blogged about that and have had varying success because it's a difficult thing to pull off really well. Um, but, I, you know, I, I chose not to go down that line because uh, I thought I would keep talking too long, but I think like what is a CMS and what is like a, a framework, those lines are kind of blurring, and what is a web 
site versus a web app versus a native app, those are also blurring. So I think, you know, if you're a good, uh, you're listening to your clients and they keep asking for those sorts of things, you're going to figure out, uh, figure out ways to do it, ways to learn it. Any other questions? That's it. All right, y'all. Thanks for coming.